Hey guys, it's Hunter. Welcome back to another episode of Ask Fish. There's so much to talk about. The questions are coming thick and fast, so I thought I'd get another one up this week. Let's just jump straight into it. Phase three ESP reaction. Yeah, so phase three, the final phase in ESP's 2021 lineup preview has dropped. This time it's all about those made in Japan E2s. Well, mostly. We'll talk about ESP USA in a second too. But the biggest question we had going into this has finally been answered. LTD's big reveal this year was that all their newest 2021 1000 series or equivalent guitars would ship with stainless steel frets. ESP USA already uses stainless steel on all their builds. E2, obviously last year they had no new models at all. Was it also because they were gearing up to put stainless steel frets on everything? The answer is no. no. The 2021 E2s will not have any stainless steel frets. And I'm not gonna lie, that is disappointing. I don't think it's necessarily a deal breaker since E2's craftsmanship and component quality are insane, but like, I guess it kind of makes sense since ESP Japan doesn't use stainless steel either, but when you've got the stainless steel sandwich in LTD and ESP USA, from an American consumer perspective, E2 not having it when they're like double the price of LTDs is kind of odd. Either way, as I said, the guitar quality is unreal. My ESP standard Eclipse E2 before the branding is the best playing guitar that I own. I rate it above my Les Paul Customs. So definitely a brand still worth checking out. Just if you were hoping for stainless steel frets, yeah, they ain't happening this year. That being said, they do have new models this year and they are back with a bang. Starting with my favorite, the Eclipse. I am such a single cup. Two new variations on the full thickness version. Tobacco Sunburst with Fishman Fluence Open Cores and Vintage Honey Burst with the Seymour Duncan JB59 set. Kind of love these with the single ply body binding. They look like great modern alternatives to the Les Paul standard. An upgrade even with the bound ebony fingerboard instead of rosewood. Given the choice, ebony or maple every time over rosewood. Just feels snappier and quicker. The normal Eclipse is also getting new finishes this year. Well, kind of. I remember reindeer blue being one of my favorite ESP standard Eclipse colors back in the day. It's been missing from the lineup for a while. Now it's back with the classic EMG 8160 combo. They've given them brushed black chrome covers as well as a bit of a modern touch. Seeing that color again, Man, I'm so glad it's back in the lineup. Then there's Granite Sparkle, which is kind of like the purple sparkle that I have wanted forever because it is such a ridiculous finish. They've taken that and just sucked all the contrast out so it's less of a visual assault. They've kept the same specs and pickup combo though. EMG 57 TW and 66 TW set. That's the splittable variants. Looks like it still doesn't have the set through neck joint, which is kind of weird. Some Eclipses have it, some Eclipses don't. Not too clear why that is, but the point is the 2021 E2 Eclipse colors look amazing. Hopefully I'll be able to get my hands on one. I'd love to shoot it out with my older ESP standard. Keeping on this Eclipse hype train, let's switch over to the super high-end ESP USA for a second. These are like the top of the line. How attached really are you to that kidney <laughs> custom shop items? The Eclipses start at like three and a half grand, four grand if you want one of the really special offerings. I believe they're all built to order off a set number of options, an a la carte type situation. Choose your model, your colors, your pickups, all of that. If you've never played around with their configurator, do it. It's a ton of fun to make all these crazy dream instruments. So they're adding new items to the menu. We've got an Eclipse FR, Eclipse with a Floyd, an Eclipse Semi Hollow, which looks crazy cool. And lastly, an M7 Baritone, which isn't pictured, but I mean, you know the M shape. There's already a seven string hardtail version. Now just imagine you can get it in a 27 inch scale length as well. Also it looks like there are new colors, including Jawbreaker. I kind of like it, but maybe it's not what I'd put on a $4,000 guitar. And then if you caught the newest video on ESP's website, you've got George Lynch absolutely shredding on an Eclipse in cold blood. It looks so, so sick. I wonder if they can do that, but in like metallic purple. I mean, saying that like I can actually afford one, right? Moving on to the pointier side of E2, the EX is back. This time in very Hetfieldy colors. You got black, you have got snow white, EMG 8160, and brushed black chrome as well. Black Godo hardware. Weirdly, it looks like there's a Photoshop error in the snow white version where it's got a third control knob. If it is real, that'd be an interesting control configuration layout that's super cramped and where one of the knobs doesn't cast a shadow. There's a new FRX in black satin. It looks like it belongs in the black metal series, but with an extra humbucker. Floyd Rose original EMG 8160TW. It's the guitar Christian Bale's Batman takes to all his gigs. Or even crime fighting sessions. That's pointy as f***. 
then New Horizon and Horizon 3s. The New Horizon 3 is a Floyd version, still neck through, Seymour Duncan Custom 5 in the bridge, Jazz in the neck. I've tried the LTD version and had the same problem with it as I do with Strats. The volume knob is so close to the bridge pickup, which is great for volume swells, but I find gets in the way of picking most of the time. Still, the black sunburst is a cool color, especially with the blacked out Seymour Duncan logos. The New Horizon comes in two colors. Black Cherry Sunburst has both string through and Floyd versions. Tiger Eye Sunburst only has a Floyd variant. EMG 57 TW and 66 TW humbuckers. That seems to be a big favorite for E2 this year, especially in that brushed black chrome. Equal parts classy and evil, I'm all about it. Then a really stripped down M1 in candy apple red satin, string through, single EMG 81. It reminds me a lot of the LTD 87M1 reissue from last year, except no Floyd and it looks like abalone inlays too. There's something refreshing about super simple, super high quality guitars. No chance for option paralysis, just get down to playing. The new seven string baritones though, <laughs> These look cool. 27 inch scale length, Evertune, Fishman Fluence pickups, comes in pearl white and granite sparkle, multiple pickup voices, never goes out of tune, no intonation issues on a high quality made in Japan guitar. And they gave it a sparkle finish, yes. Amazing, well done. Yes, now make an Eclipse version. And the last one on the list is a new SN2. Same specs as the one that's already available in Blue Natural Fade, Floyd Rose Original Bridge, Bare Knuckle Aftermath pickups with Battle Worn covers, then a Buckeye Brawl Top in Nebula Black Burst. Dope take on a modern Super Strat. But yeah, so that's phase three in a nutshell. It's a great selection of stuff. I think any other year it would be more impressive. New Les Paul Standard inspired models, Hetfieldy EX models, seven strings with Evertunes and Fishman Fluence pickups. All of that is amazing. That last part especially since those super modern specs have been missing from this premium line. It just comes at a time where LTD, the supposed lower tier brand, is making a huge statement with their widespread adoption of stainless steel frets across so much of the new line. That's one of the biggest stories, not only from ESP, but in the affordable guitar category in general this year. That's really hard to top and you expected it to be on E2s as well this year. But yeah, so now we've pretty much got the full picture, the full context of ESP's 2021 lineup. What do you think? What are your thoughts? What models are most exciting to you? Let me know in the comments. Kirk got a new SIG out. Right, so in that same video where that gold blood finish was revealed, you might have noticed that ESP teased a new Kirk Hammett signature. The video starts off with Kirk playing an ESP KH3 Spider, which is one of his older signature models. And you might think, well, yeah, he's one of your biggest artists. Why would you not want him at the beginning of your teaser video? Nothing to see here. Except 30 seconds into the video where they're listing the new signature models that will be highlighted during their virtual ESP Presents 2021 event, the very first one on the list is Kirk Hammett LTD KH3 Spider. It's been out of production for a while and for the 30th anniversary of the Black Album, it looks like we're getting a reissue. Yes, I knew it. Metallica, let's go. And in all likelihood with stainless steel frets, so it'll be an improvement over the original. Obviously, it'll probably have his signature EMG Bone Breakers too. That's an 8160A combination. The LTD will probably have the normal covers with the green EMG logos, not the signature covers. The way that Metallica releases go, there's usually a more limited edition ESP version to go with the LTD. That might have the signature covers, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, so right now, not much to know except that that reissue is coming. Metallica, flat top single cut, it'll have the Floyd, but I can look past that because it's <coughs> Metallica and it's a single cut. It's like the combination of my two favorite things. I remember first seeing that guitar in the video of them from 1991 playing Enter Sandman at Toshino Airfield to apparently <coughs> everyone in Moscow. I think the video was in 240p at best, potato quality, but it was still so f***ing cool. I can't wait. So looking forward to seeing more about that in the coming days. But yeah, what do you think of the return of the Cage Spider? Was it the reissue that you were expecting? Given that this is the 30th anniversary of the Black Album, do you think that there's something on the horizon possibly for James Hetfield as well? Any and all thoughts? Let me know them down below. Yo, update though. I was just about to go to bed, but thanks to an absolute hero who will remain anonymous. You know who you are though. We have some actual pictures and specs 
of the upcoming KH3 release. As expected, there will be two versions, an ESP that'll go for $4,700, limited to just 24 pieces worldwide. Like, wow, those are gone instantly. And then an LTD for $1,300 in production only this year. Just like I thought, the ESP will have the signature covers and the LTD will have the green logo covers. And just like in previous recent Kirkhammer signature runs, the ESP version will be scalloped from the 17th to the 24th frets, while the LTD will not be scalloped. I was kind of hoping for more scallop action after LTD experimented with it last year in the SN1000 HT, but no such luck. Yeah, it's spoken as if I'm a fucking shredder. But yeah, this is awesome. I know there are a ton of people who've wanted to get one of these forever, especially with the full graphic and inlay set. The old LTDs did not have the spider graphics. Most of them had dot inlays, not the spider ones. You'll be able to tell this run apart at a distance though, because the spider is more green, and I mean a lot more green than it was on any of the previous runs. For the rest of the specs, maple, neck through, and alder wings. So that's more like on the older runs, the more recent runs, switch to mahogany somewhere along the way. Now we're going back to the OG specs. Both models are neck through, which is what Kirk actually uses. Makassar ebony fingerboards, that's another change. Every single other iteration of the Spider had rosewood fingerboards. Ebony has a snappier tone and will really help the wah cut through in a mix. I kid, I'm so excited for these. Even though the headstock is ugly and it's got a floor. I don't care, it's Kirk Hammett, it's Metallica, it's a single cut. I don't play the shit out of it. In the notes that I have, it doesn't say anything about the stainless steel frets. Like if Japan is handling the ESP version, is it possible that the LTD is better spent in that regard. That'd be awkward. But yeah, finally an LTD version of one of the most iconic guitars in Metallica lore with the full Spider graphics package, neck through, ebony fingerboard, possibly stainless steel frets. Yeah, yeah. Sign me up. Now that's just my opinion coming from a massive Metallica fan. What do you guys think? Spider reissue, love it, hate it. When are you pre-ordering yours? <laughs> Thoughts on the Mesa Boogie acquisition by Gibson? People are losing their <laughs> over it, lol. Yeah, I think everybody saw that fluff tweet the night before the official announcement. Gibson buying Mesa Boogie? Honestly, when I first saw it, I thought it was a troll. I thought it was something he might be doing for a video. How fast can a rumor spread if it involves two of the largest and quite frankly, most polarizing companies in this industry. Turns out, not really a rumor anymore. What do I mean not really a rumor? It's 100% true. Mesa Boogie is now a Gibson brand. And you're absolutely right, people are losing their shit over it as if a Gibson acquisition is the harbinger for death. RIP Mesa. Oh, so now rectifiers will go out of tune after every song? Hope mine doesn't arrive with a broken headstock. Mesa, play authentic. You know, insert your Gibson jab here. And given Gibson's track record, it's kind of understandable. They do deserve some <laughs> They have a reputation for buying and subsequently killing brands in the name of becoming a lifestyle brand themselves. And we don't really need to get into that because this is a different situation. This is different management. And that's partially why my initial reaction to the rumor is like, there's no way. Gibson has been in this situation before, buying up brands to expand their footprint in the overall music gear industry. They weren't very good at it. And ultimately, it very famously ended in chapter 11. Again though, now different. Now they have seemingly, at least on the business side, more competent management. Anyway, my initial reaction is a moot point because it's happened now. So what does this mean? In the short term, probably nothing. The founder, Randall Smith, will pick up a new fancy Gibson title as master designer and pioneer of Mesa Boogie. And Mesa will reportedly still operate as it has been. People have concerns over quality going forward. And again, you can see where they're coming from. Gibson hasn't had the best reputation when it comes to QC in modern times. But since new management, it seems to be much better. It's more consistent. The new leadership seems to understand that quality is what the modern customer looks for since Gibson isn't even close to the only horse in town anymore. Quality is how Mesa Boogie built their reputation, and I doubt Gibson would want to jeopardize that. Mesa's managed to build a very loyal customer base over many years. That's definitely a reason why they partnered up. So I don't think Gibson will have much of a say when it comes to what products they release or how they're built. Like, I think it's more of a distribution and capital kind of a deal. Even so, I have no doubt we're going to see some insane used listings for pre-Gibson rectifiers going for stupid prices, especially in the next year or so, and then in another 20, probably. But no, I think Mesa Boogie joining forces with Gibson is a good thing. The big biggest benefit is distribution. Maces are great, they are not sold in a lot of places. They're at Sweetwater, but especially in physical stores, they're not at Guitar Center, they're not at Sam Ash. Like there's nowhere to test one out before you buy, so they can definitely benefit from Gibson's 
quite frankly, insane dealership network. The international aspect is super important, and I think it's a big factor of why Gibson was tempted to bring Mesa Boogie under its umbrella. The Mesa Boogie name is legendary to guitar players worldwide. Their international distribution, though, has been a struggle. Living in the US, I sometimes forget how difficult they are to find worldwide. Here you can go on Craigslist at any time and get some sort of dual or triple rectifier for about a thousand bucks. They're relatively plentiful, and that's just not the case anywhere else. And while they're not exactly cheap here, they're much more expensive outside of this country. So Gibson, with their world-class international distribution network, they've got the opportunity to get them into more stores and bring the prices down around the world. That opportunity to make Mesa Boogie a more widely available brand worldwide is probably a big factor of why the Joan Forces. And I think that's one of the most exciting potential aspects of the deal. Of course, they can also lend their financial muscle, giving Mesa more resources, whether that's used to bring production costs down or develop new products or technologies to compete with other forward-thinking amp companies, more lunchbox heads, more MIDI integration, having the ability to have more products in the current lineup at a time. Because remember, they've got a huge name, but they're still a relatively small company. Road King 3, 20 watt mini triple crown, Let's go. Yeah, so obviously we'll have to wait and see how the execution goes, but potentially if Gibson plays it right, this could be a great new era for Mesa fans. On a purely selfish, personal niche point of view as a YouTuber, I'm excited. I got to work a lot directly with the Gibson family and brands last year, especially Epiphone with the Inspired by Gibson collection and the Prophecies. We even gave away a Les Paul Prophecy together. Mesa Boogie generally does their own thing. They haven't even shown up to NAMM in years. So hopefully now this marks the return of Mesa at the Gibson booth next year because Gibson always has the massive borderline spectacle presence at NAMM. And also hopefully them joining Gibson means I'll be able to work directly with them Never done that before. My dual rec is one of my favorite amps and I will never sell it. So yeah, working with Mesa, that would be fun. Anyway, I think people are overreacting because it is Gibson and they are still trying to shake that reputation. The way I see it, best case scenario, more products, more availability. Worst case scenario, maybe there's some growing pains. Maybe there's a short period where quality dips slightly. I don't see that happening though. I think the former is much more likely. Well, what do you think? Am I being too optimistic? Should I be more on the side of doom and gloom? Any and all thoughts you have about the situation, I'd love to know in the comments. Music recommendation, I've been absolutely hooked to shh by Stand Atlantic. They're a pop punk group out of Sydney. Before I got into metal, pop punk was my sh will always have a soft spot for it. Anyway, the guitar tone is excellent. The chorus is stupid catchy. And there's something about the singer's voice too. I don't know, I love it. She's got a great voice. The screams are fire too. Definitely check it out, link in the description. And that'll do it for this episode of Ask a Fish. If you enjoyed it, do me a favor and hit that like button, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. Social media, merch, and Discord server links are in the description. As always, thanks so much for watching. You've been awesome and I'll see you for the next video.